just a quick content warning, there's a bit of swearing in this podcast. Hi, is this Dave? Yeah, I know who I'm talking to. So I understand you've left a message for us. Yeah, you heard it? I haven't heard the message, but I'm happy to hear... So you're, you're the one who's been interviewing Gail all the time, all these years? Yes, that's right. Well, I'll tell you what, she'll pull the wool over your eyes. Okay, so do you have a specific... I mean, Adam Dudding here. That tape is of a guy called David Arnott talking to Amy Mars back in July 2018. It was a few weeks after we'd released Gone Fishing. If you haven't already heard all eight episodes, stop now. Go back, listen to them first. Without that context, what's coming up won't make much sense. And for those of you who have heard the full series but have forgotten some of the details, here's a really quick recap. One night in 1989, a young man called Dean Fuller Sands told his family he was going rock fishing off Auckland's west coast, then disappeared. Most people figured he'd drowned, but eight years later, police started looking into some stories that had been told about a possible murder around 1989 involving an unnamed body in the boot of a car. Eventually, police concluded that the mystery victim must have been Dean Fuller Sands, that his disappearance was a murder, not a drowning. And they also concluded that the killer was a career criminal called Stephen Stone and that Stone had done it at the request of a woman called Gail Maney, who was angry because Dean had stolen some drugs from her. Then, just before the trial of Gail Maney and Stephen Stone and some others was meant to start, police were approached by someone else who said Stephen Stone had also killed a young woman called Leah Stevens around the same time. The two murder investigations were wrapped together, and in the final version of events that was taken to trial, police said Leah Stevens had been killed because she'd witnessed Dean Fuller Sand's death a week earlier. Also, they said that the murder of Dean had happened in Gail Maney's garage, in front of numerous witnesses, and that Stone then handed the gun around and made others shoot the body, so they'd be implicated too. Oh, and Gail Maney has always denied all of this. Got all that? So... That's the background of Gone Fishing, in a nutshell. Okay, so David Arnott, who you just heard talking to Amy, he was that first guy who went to police in 1997 to tell them the stories he'd been told about a body in a boot. So he's the starting point for the investigation that would eventually lead to Gail Maney spending 15 years in jail for murder. While making Gone Fishing, we tried to track down David Arnott because he was such an important part of Gail's story. But we didn't find him. Or rather, he didn't get back to us. To listen to your messages, press 1. And then, soon after the podcast was released... You rang me. It's David Arnott. Tell you some truth. He started tracking us down, leaving some rather stern voicemails asking us to call back. You better listen to me, mate. You better listen to me. Then finally, Amy got through to him and they talked for a quarter of an hour or so. We learnt that he was no great fan of Gail. Be very, very weary of her. But curiously enough, he said he didn't think she'd been involved in the death of Dean Fuller Sands. No, I actually believe that she had done, um, she didn't plan a killing. And I never ever told the police that. I just said, what I heard was a guy, Steve Stone, body in the boot. That's pretty well me, OK? But as far as I know, Dale wasn't involved in the conversation in the beginning. Right, it was only Steve Stone. I don't know how Gail got pulled into it, actually. It turned out the main reason he was calling us was to complain about us using his name in the podcast. It really pisses me off. Yeah. Especially when I'm the one who came forward to give you all the information to solve the murder, and then all these have got name suppression, and I haven't. Yeah. So Amy pointed out that, like it or not, he'd been part of the case, and his involvement and his name were part of the public record. I know that, but that's up to you whether you want to print my fucking name or not. So yeah, it was a short interview that didn't really tell us much we didn't already know, and it arrived too late for the main podcast, so that audio file has just been sitting on my computer ever since. A few other bits and bobs came in around the same time. We heard from someone associated with the Fuller Sands family, and they said they were absolutely certain the police had got the right people. We heard from someone who said they'd gone to a party at Larnock Road once, and that it was a heavy scene with some pretty rough people, so... No surprises there. We heard from someone who used to know Colin Maney, and they believed that the story about the garage shooting was probably true. We heard from someone who'd bumped into Stephen Stone once and hadn't liked him at all. In other words, we were hearing the same kind of mix of claims and opinions that we'd collected while making the podcast. 
But the reason we've dusted all this off and come back into the studio now, a whole year later, is that recently there have been some genuinely significant updates to Gail Maney's story. We figured it was time for a catch-up mini-episode. We figured you'd want to know about the day Gail Maney thought she was going back to prison, and about some new allegations that had been made against the police. And we thought you'd also want to hear from the man who's determined to take a closer look inside the garage at 22 Larnack Road. Amy has kept in touch with Gail over the past year, mostly by phone. Those conversations are always pretty entertaining. They usually last between an hour and an hour and a half, where we just chat about the case and what's going on in her life and what's going on in my life. <laughs> and yeah. But last month, both of us sat down with Gail, with the recorder running, for a catch-up. No one's actually come up to me directly and spoken to me, but... There is kind of like if I'm in the supermarket or something like that, I see some people stop and they take a second look. Gail said after Gone Fishing was released, she started being recognised in public. And I might see them nudging each other and they generally smile at me and I'm thinking, OK, I think those people might have recognised me, but I can't be sure. She's also received messages of support on Facebook. I've actually had a lot of people publicly um, get in touch with me and send me messages and they've all been positive messages of support for me and my family. Reactions to the podcast from people closer to her, especially immediate family, have been more complex, though. It stirs up a lot of you know, memories for them because it's traumatic. What's happened is they lost each other, they lost their home, they lost their mother, and just their right to have a normal life as children and grow up you know, in a, with a family and some stability. They're dealing with a lot as well. Gail has moved from the Waikato back to Auckland, but in many ways her life is much the same as before. I'm living with family, just temporarily. (laughs) I am trying to find accommodation, but it's it's actually difficult. I've got to explain to a landlord basically, you know, oh, I've got this murder conviction because they do criminal checks on you. And it's a difficult thing to dump onto someone (laughs) or offload, I should say, um, because they kind of, it's a shock. She's living with her daughter. Yeah, I've got my own room and most of my stuff is still in storage, which I want to get out. (laughs) But with my grandchildren, generally, my daughter takes them to school and sometimes I help her out and pick them up and um, I had to cook dinner last night for them and it's like hard work. (laughs) Why is it hard? Because um, I'm not used to cooking for a family. (laughs) And then last night I did, then I did put too much hot um, hot sweet chilli sauce on my grandson's um, dinner. Gail was in jail for 15 years and even though she's out now, as a convicted murderer, she's on life parole, which means she has to follow the rules. And there are lots of rules. I'm definitely not free because I've got a lot of restrictions and up until not that long ago I was on a curfew, <laughs> nine at night till seven in the morning. Um, I not, don't really drink alcohol, but I'm not even allowed to have a glass of wine or anything like that. Yeah, I've got to notify them if I get a job, um, notify them about address, notify them if I'm going to have a relationship. It's like they don't have any privacy in my life. I'm always scared that if I do something wrong that I'm going to get in trouble and I could get recalled back to prison. So that's pretty scary because they can, they've done it to me before and they can just put me back in there. When Gail moved to Auckland, she had to seek approval in advance to live at her daughter's place. And when that approval process got messed up, she feared the worst. When it came time to move, yeah, nothing had been done and it was kind of distressing. In the end, this supervisor rung me and they basically told me firmly that I had to be in the office at a specific time, um, not to be late. And it brings back that stuff of when they recall me because they can just, at any time, um, if they think that I'm a risk, they can just take me away. Her tone made me feel as if I was going to be going there in the morning and the police would suddenly come through that door and take me back to prison. Yeah, so that gives me those, yeah, those flashbacks. And actually what did happen, that meeting? How did it unfold? They maybe waited in the room for about half an hour. And I kept thinking, is the other police going to come and take me? (laughs) Um, Then he just came down and he just asked me to sign some papers and gave me an order to... Um, reports in the probation office in Auckland within a certain time frame and said I could go. (laughs) 
Alongside the day-to-day challenges of life on parole, Gail's had a much bigger project on the go. Something that started very soon after Gone Fishing was released. I brought all my boxes, all the files that I've carried close to me for all these years that I was in prison. I just felt like I had someone that I could trust with them and I dumped them off on them, (laughs) which was quite a relief. And I knew that they were safe and in the right hands. Yep, Gail has been digging through all her files again because there's a new investigator looking into her case. The next chapter of Gail Maney's unending battle to prove she isn't a murderer has started. Can you hear me fine? I can hear you. We can, yeah, yeah, we're all working. Oh yeah, cool, okay, we're off. We're, we're going. So what happened was that um, just as Gone Fishing was being released, Amy got in touch with a guy called... Tim McKinnell. Tim McKinnell. I'm an investigator at a company called Zivest, uh, and when the Gone Fishing podcast came out, I was contacted by Amy and asked to come in and give her some of my ideas around uh, wrongful convictions and what I thought of Gail's case. We were just hoping he'd find it interesting enough that he'd give us some general comments we could use in a news story as we launched the podcast. But it turned into something much bigger. I have to be honest, when Amy contacted me about the case, I wasn't particularly interested, at least initially. It was was sensational and some of the characters looked interesting. There was sort of an element of seediness to it, you know, with gang members and hookers and all of those sorts of things. But I'm contacted fairly regularly about different cases, people claiming to be innocent. So I'd... By no means did I think that it was going to be one of those cases. The reason people keep calling Tim McKinnell is because of what happened with the Taina Pora case. Taina Pora, a free man after two Mr Pora was declared innocent of the, the 1992 of rape and wrongful conviction. Well and catastrophic miscarriage of justice, and it was. Taina was a, a 17-year-old Māori boy from South Auckland, and he'd been convicted of the rape and murder of Susan Burdett. I was a cop when he was uh, convicted for the second time in 2000, uh, and there were concerns at that time within the police about the integrity of those convictions. Uh, I was in a position in around 2009 to make contact with Tainer. I'd set up Zivest, was running my own company, and went and saw Tainer and talked about his case. Uh, I got involved uh, from that point on, really, and spent the six, next six or seven years working with the legal team, Jonathan Krebs and Ingrid Squire, on that case, and ultimately we were able to prove that he was completely innocent. So now Amy was asking Tim for his thoughts about the Gail Maney case. I didn't know a great deal about it and spoke in general terms around the principles and things I'd learned in the Tainer Porter case. And following on from that, tried to learn a little bit more about the case. When the podcast came out and I started listening and reading some of the information around it, it was pretty clear to me there were some concerning features to it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem, but it warrants a closer look. There were some things that jumped out in terms of the way the police collected the evidence uh, from people that were initially telling a variety of versions of events. There was a substantial delay between the claimed murder of Dean Fuller Sands and this case being put together. Uh, And when you looked at that and the supposed link with Leah Stevens' murder, there were some aspects of that that I thought were concerning on first glance. And so it had piqued my curiosity. I was interested enough to have a closer look, and I said to Amy that I'd be happy to meet Gail and talk to her about it. And after meeting Gail, Tim was in. One of the first things that I did was discuss legal representation. I put Gail in contact with Julianne Kincaid and her junior, Aya Shendi. Uh, Julianne is a, a barrister here in Auckland. So we put them together together. Julianne, Aya and Gail, and and we met and we talked about the case and first steps. That is, the first steps towards helping Gail Maney with the thing she's been trying to do for decades now. Prove that she's innocent. Prove that she didn't ask Stephen Stone to kill Dean Fuller Sands in 1989. Prove that she's not guilty of murder. The first step in any investigation like this is collecting the information. And in this case, it's an extraordinarily large task. Just to be clear, although it was the podcast and that call from Amy that first got Tim interested in Gail's case, from that point on, Gail and Tim and the legal team have been following their own path and doing it all again from scratch. There are four people convicted of involvement in two different murders. There are four key Crown witnesses whose evidence needs to be properly assessed. And there are files everywhere. There are 
files with the police. There are files with the Crown, Court of Appeal, the High Court, and then there are files everywhere in between. You need to have everything. So we've begun that process. Equally, though Amy and I are obviously super interested in where all this leads, we're not part of that team in any way. We're still just journalists following a story. It became pretty clear to us quite quickly that just a couple of lawyers and an investigator couldn't do it. So Julianne has got help from other lawyers. Uh, Meg Gerond is somebody that is helping me with the uh, investigative side of things. And that is sort of the four that are most heavily involved in the case at the moment. The team has been granted some legal aid money to work on Gail's case, but Tim says they're also putting in lots of voluntary hours. He says there are two or three options potentially open to Gail. She's already appealed to the Court of Appeal and had a retrial. Uh, She appealed again to the Court of Appeal, failed, and then took an appeal to the Supreme Court and failed at that as well. And so that makes it very difficult for her to have another appeal. But uh, Julianne and her team have done some work and we think that potentially the door might be open to go back to the court one more time. You can't go to court and appeal because I'm innocent. That's not an appeal point. And so it needs to be far more refined and legalistic than that. And so that's one of the things that we're going through at the moment is working out whether we can meet the thresholds and tick those boxes in the right way. Another option is if Gail applies for something called a Royal Prerogative of Mercy. That's a special process for people who've exhausted all their appeals where the Minister of Justice gets directly involved. It can lead to a pardon or a change in sentence or a referral back to the courts. But these are pretty uncommon, and for now, McKinnell isn't keen to go down that path. It is overly bureaucratic, it can be political, and it can take a very, very long time. And so if there is a way for Gail to get back to the courts, then from my perspective, that is what we'd like to do. Early on, Gail's new team had a bit of a breakthrough. Remember how there are four key witnesses who hold up the police case. The two guys with name suppression who we called Neil and Martin, and two women. That's Tanya Wilson and a woman with name suppression who we called Sonia. As we explained in that final episode of Gone Fishing, Tanya Wilson has tried to recant her evidence against Gail, but the appeal court said she was an unreliable witness and that this wasn't enough to get Gail another trial. Now, in that episode, we also said that the private investigator, John Bradley, reckoned this other woman, Sonia, had told him that she too had lied about the shooting in the garage. But Bradley wasn't able to get Sonia to go on the record or sign an affidavit, which meant that the appeal court wasn't interested. The Court of Appeal didn't consider that evidence at all. But then the podcast came out, followed by our news report saying Gail had teamed up with Tim and some lawyers, including Julianne Kincaid. And very soon after that... Julianne was contacted by uh, this witness, Sonia, and we met with and spoke with her about her evidence. What the team really wanted from her was an affidavit, a formal, signed witness declaration from Sonia, but it took a while to get her to that point. She was incredibly nervous, quite scared about her position, but ultimately what has emerged from that is she has sworn an affidavit completely and utterly retracting her evidence from the 2000 trial. Like Tanya Wilson, she says no shooting ever happened. It was completely fabricated. In fact, she went further than that. She says that the reason that she gave that evidence was because she felt that she had no choice, that she was put under pressure by police with a variety of threats and techniques that made it clear to her that she was either to tell them what they needed to hear or she would be in the dock herself. Amy and I wrote a news story about that affidavit, and not long after that, Tim McKinnell received an anonymous letter. It was written in such a way that led us to believe it was written by a police officer. It was quite uh, familiar with some of the investigating officers, and it made some quite strong allegations about the way they conducted themselves. And so that letter was interesting to us because some of the issues that it highlighted were issues that we're starting to unravel now with our work. He publicly called for the letter writer to get back in touch. It's of little value to us, an anonymous letter. But he's still waiting. 
we may have spooked them, I don't know, I hope not. And that was always a risk with publicising something like that. But without publicity, we have nothing anyway, so we've lost nothing. As this new team tries to rebuild once again the case for Gail's innocence, Tim has some interesting plans up his sleeve. One of the things that we're looking at is this uh, supposed execution in a garage where nine people stand around while a tenth person is shot repeatedly. I've seen photographs and descriptions and Gail's very clear on this. The garage at that address is tiny. And I think that there might be some value in us, even as investigators and lawyers, and going there and reenacting what the Crown says happened in there to give us a sense of what it is they're claiming. When you look at cases like this, you give it the sniff test. How reasonable does it sound? And if you look at what the Crown case is, that nine people who didn't know each other particularly well got together in a garage and executed a man for a relatively minor infraction, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. And I think going to the garage, reenacting what is claimed to have happened as best we can based on the evidence of these four witnesses, I think it would be a valuable exercise. Even a small garage can still take nine humans in it. I mean, so it's not, it's not about proving a physical impossibility, is it? It's not about proving a physical impossibility. It's more the vibe, Adam. <laughs> uh, it's not. And, and, and juries and, and judges have been to the address. So this isn't new. It's not fresh. But I think it still can be important. Uh, yes, there might have been 10 people in that room, but supposedly there were between six and eight bullets flying around as well in that small space. And you've got issues around ricochet, uh, indentations, you know. How viable is that? case. You know, part of it's just for our own satisfaction to go there and understand what it is we're dealing with. It's difficult sometimes to deal with things in the abstract. So for us, there's interest in our team going there and seeing it for ourselves. We think that we'll look at doing that soon. Dean Fuller Sands disappeared in 1989. Gail was first convicted of his murder in 1999, when she was 31 years old, and again at the retrial in 2000. There were failed appeal attempts in 2005 and 2007. Gail's now 52. She's been at this a really long time. This attempt to prove my innocence most definitely feels different to other times, as I'm not blocked off by four walls or... um, in prison where you can't just reach out to people or have communication and things like that. This time I've got people who are in good positions to help me and they have looked at my evidence and they believe in my innocence as well, which is like really important. There's a lot of work to be done, but we're getting there. (laughs) And there's still a long way to go. I know that, but patience is a virtue, I guess. As we wrap up the interview, there's something else she wants to talk about. What about the family? Hey, the Fuller Sandys family. Have you spoken to them? Or? No, but I just always think about what it's like for them. You know, they they are um, they're reliving this continuously because with all the publicity and what's going on for me, you know, this affects everybody. There's a lot of people's lives that it's impacting on. So you know, I think about you know how are they coping with all this because they are they are victims too of what the police have done wrong. You know, it's been a long time for them and. They deserve the truth as well. Tim McKinnell says finding that truth could take a while. The problem with these cases is is resourcing, not just for us, but for the police as well, and they take a long, long time to work through. You know, it's the long haul. We're in the middle of the police providing disclosure to us. There are thousands and thousands of pages of disclosure. We need to have all of that before we make any firm decisions about what next. We've got some quite clear ideas of what we need to do as a priority over the coming weeks, but where we'll be in three months' time, I have no idea. So that's it for now. Amy's overseas at the moment, but she and I will both keep following this story. As Tim McKinnell said, these things really don't move very fast, so it may be a while before there's anything new to report. But stay subscribed, and someday soon we may be popping up in your feed with another update. Till then, thanks for listening.
Gone Fishing is a joint production from RNZ and Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poog and Jana Witter. The executive producers were Justin Gregory and Tim Watkin. For more on Gone Fishing, visit stuff.co.nz slash gonefishing, or you can go to the RNZ homepage and click on Podcasts.